Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's so great to be here today. The corporate kingdom finally comes to an end. There's a new sheriff in town, and accountability will be the order of the day. I want to thank John Shirley, president of the Reedy Creek Firefighters Association. They're going to need a new name soon um, for being here with us. And I want to thank all the first responders uh, who've been working in this district. Uh, one of the things that we think we can do now uh, with removing self-governing status from Disney is actually uh, do uh, better recognition of your service. Mandy Schaefer's here, a mother, an Osceola County resident, and Nick uh, Caterano, founder of GoofyVaccine.com and a Disney employee. We're also joined by uh, members of uh, the Fire Rescue Department here, uh, as well as, I think we have Representative Amesti, where is she? Yeah, there she is, over there. Welcome. Thanks for coming. So as all of you know, we uh, made the decision uh, last year uh, to go in a different direction with respect to how Disney is governed. And since the 1960s, they've enjoyed privileges unlike any company or individual in the state of Florida has ever enjoyed. Uh, they, of course, controlled their own government uh, right here in central Florida. Uh, they had exemptions from laws that everybody else uh, had to follow, uh, and they were able to get huge amounts of benefits without paying their fair share of taxes, and even racked up $700 million worth of municipal debt. So we had a, a little bit of a tussle last year over uh, school legislation, and, and Disney came out uh, against something that was really just about protecting young kids and making sure that students are able to go to school learning to read, write, add, and subtract, and not having a teacher tell them that they can change their gender. And I think most parents agree with that. Uh, but, you know, that was only a mild annoyance. I think that what we came to realize after that dust settled on that uh, was you clearly had a movement within the corporation itself, of course, Burbank, California-based elements of it, that said it's their job or it's their goal to inject a lot of this sexuality into the programming for young kids. And I'm a dad, six, four, and two, and my wife and I, and I know parents throughout Florida, uh, we want our kids to be kids. We want them to be able to enjoy entertainment, school, uh, without having an agenda imposed upon them. And so if you're going that way as a corporation, uh, those are not the values that we want to promote in the state of Florida. Uh, we want to promote uh, the safety of our students and uh, the rights of our parents. So we had this situation here that was basically indefensible from a policy perspective. How do you give one theme park its own government and then treat all the other theme parks differently? And so we believe that um, that, that was not good policy. We believe being joined at the hip with this one California-based company was not something that was justifiable or sustainable. And so we said we we're going to do something about it. And so now we're basically, Disney's going to be treated like SeaWorld is treated or like any of these others. And that's really uh, the, the, the fair thing to do. So I'll be signing the bill momentarily, and that will officially end the self-governing status uh, here in Central Florida for Disney. My signature will also end Disney's exemption from the Florida Building Code and Florida Fire Prevention Code. It will end Disney's exemption from state regulatory reviews and approval. Uh, it will end Disney's secrecy by finally ensuring transparency about what goes on in this area. It will ensure that Disney pays its fair share of taxes. It will prevent local governments dominated by leftist politicians from using this situation to raise local taxes. If you remember when we...
Remember when we first said that we were uh, going to go in a different direction and, and change the status quo, uh, local politicians, uh, particularly in Orange County, were saying that that would mean that the debt of Disney would get dumped on their taxpayers, uh, they would have to do services, and it would cause major property tax increases for people in Central Florida. Now, I rejected that. A lot of media reported that that would happen, and I said that will not happen. And so even though, and I'll announce here who, who's going to be uh, running Disney on behalf of the state, even though I would like eventually the local government to just take this, uh, I was not going to put taxpayers at risk, and I did not trust them to be able to handle this at this point. So it's under state control, not local control. They may be able to negotiate something in the future, uh, but right now there will be no additional tax burden on any Flor Floridian in Central Florida or otherwise. And in fact, <laughs> and in fact, for the whole decades that this has been in effect, you have infrastructure feeding into the theme parks that were paid for by all the citizens of Central Florida, and Disney really got a free ride on that. Now they can be taxed for that. Uh, so if anything, it's going to reduce the tax burden of people in Central Florida. It also imposes, my signature in this bill will also impose uh, Florida law uh, on this area, just like it's imposed on Universal Studios and SeaWorld and all these other places. Uh, and this bill and the structure that we've created in this bill will ensure that the municipal debt that's been racked up uh, will be paid by Disney, not by Florida taxpayers. And so this is what accountability looks like. Uh, this is what standing up for Florida taxpayers uh, in the rule of law looks like. And I'm really happy that the legislature was able uh, to do this. You know, last year when we did the initial, uh, people were saying the debts, all this other stuff. We said, we're going to take care of it. Don't worry. Uh, we're going to take care of it. We got time to think about the best way, way to do it. And I'm confident that, that this is a way that is going to vindicate the best interest of the state of Florida. So Disney loses self-governing status. The state of Florida is the new sheriff in town. But, you know, I got a lot on my plate. I can't be running this, uh, you know, from the governor's office. So we've created a state control board uh, that is going to be responsible for governing uh, this area. And I'm pleased to announce that uh, I am going to later today uh, formally appoint uh, the following uh, to the control board. So uh, Martin Garcia uh, from Tampa, who I'm appointing as chair of the board, uh, Bridget Ziegler, a member of the Sarasota uh, County School Board, uh, Brian Ungst from Pinellas County, uh, Mike Sasso, a lawyer here in Central Florida, um, and businessman uh, Ron Perry. They've got a lot of work to do. Uh, they know that our vision is, okay, yes, Disney no longer has its uh, own government, uh, but you got to ensure that all these laws are applied, you got to ensure the debt is paid, and you got to ensure the fair share of taxes are paid. And so they're going to be getting to work very soon. There's a board meeting scheduled a week from Wednesday, and so they will be uh, in charge during that board meeting. So buckle up. There's a lot, lot to get done. And one of the things that uh, I've asked them to do when they convene a week from Wednesday is to uh, look at the compensation for the first responders and give them more compensation for doing a good job. And so I hope we'll, we'll be able to get that done. So we appreciate the, the legislature uh, engaging in this. Uh, I think that if you looked at the, 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 the uh, priorities that I had with respect to this, uh, with, with not letting them govern themselves, make them live under the same laws, them being solely responsible for the debts and for taxes, uh, this does that. And I think it does it in a way not only with no harm to taxpayers throughout central Florida or other parts of Florida, uh, but uh, possibly lowering the burden, because I think you're going to get more help on infrastructure now, uh, given all the infrastructure that's benefited this area. So I'm going to sign it in a minute, but first we have some folks that, that we're going to hear from. So John from the Fire Rescue, you want to come up and... Uh...
morning, everybody. I wanted to start this off by first and foremost uh, thanking our governor, Ron DeSantis, and everyone that, uh, that's here in attendance for taking time out of their day to be here. Uh, it is our great honor to have all of you here at our firehouse for this historic event. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is John Shirey. I'm the president of the Reedy Creek Professional Firefighters. And I just wanted to speak briefly about why the signing of this bill today is of such great importance to the 200 firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, 911 communicators, and fire prevention personnel here at the Reedy Creek Fire Department. Uh, for many years, there has been a blatant disregard and uh, a bias against the uh, first responders here. Um, the lack of concern for public safety has been very apparent. Um, by the Reedy Creek administration and this current Board of Supervisors. Uh, this bias has created major public safety shortcomings. Uh, in the past two years, we have faced major shortages of firefighter paramedics as well as ambulances, um, which oftentimes led to major delays in responding to emergency calls. Um, uh, across the district in the fire department, on any given day, uh, we do not have the bare minimum number of firefighters recommended by the National Fire Protection Association to respond to a structure fire in the majority of our response areas. Our emergency vehicles like fire trucks and ambulances are in disrepair. Oftentimes, we can't even put the bare minimum number of fire apparatus on the roads to respond to emergencies. While these things continue to occur, the district's communication director misleads the public with inaccurate statements about our emergency vehicle uh, readiness, uh, the adequacy of the number of first responders on property, as well as our overall emergency services capabilities. And while that goes on, the current district administrator boasts about the fact that he was able to roll over over 30 plus million dollars from a single year's budget alone. Uh, it, it would seem that keeping Disney's money in the district's bank accounts has become more of a priority than protecting and adequately equipping the fire department to respond to the calls and protect the guests and property here at Disney. My point in speaking on all of this is that our governor, Ron DeSantis, has proven time and time again to be a champion for public safety and for the first responders in the great state of Florida. By removing the single interest Disney-controlled Board of Supervisors and with his upcoming appointment of the new board, who I have full faith will properly oversee and run the district and put administrators in place that take their responsibility to the public seriously. Um, he has ensured that public safety will once again be a priority at the district and the millions of U.S. residents and tourists from around the world will be fully and properly protected. Governor, thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you, John. Okay, Mandy Schaefer. Good morning. Thank you, Governor DeSantis, for allowing me this opportunity to speak. As a parent who no longer trusts Disney, my name is Mandy Schaefer, and I have called Florida home for 41 years, living in Osceola County for 37 years. I grew up, in Dis or I grew up going to Disney from a young girl. Throughout my adolescent years, I had friends whose parents or grandparents were Disney cast members, allowing me free access to the Disney parks. As teenagers, groups of us would spend the day at Magic Kingdom and then take the monorail to Epcot or um, the bus to MGM, aka Hollywood Studios. Going to Disney was just a part of my life growing up in this area. Even after I married my husband, visiting the Disney parks was a normal occurrence for us and our son when he was born. I vividly remember the Christmas morning we first received our annual passes. My parents came over to open gifts and my husband surprised all five of us with annual passes for Disney. That was 14 years ago and I still remember that morning. Our passes were our family entertainment and we used them often. Our family traditions revolved around different events that Disney would have based on seasons like Mickey's Not So Scary Halloween and then Mickey's Very Merry Christmas Party. Our absolute favorite tradition was candlelight. We always picked the dinner package, that way we were guaranteed a seat at the processional. 
As pass holders, we also vacationed many times at the various resorts, Fort Wilderness being our favorite. My son would bring a friend, and we would camp for the weekend, enjoying all the amenities. Even as a teenager myself, I would go camping at Fort Wilderness with friends' families every Memorial Day weekend. The families would go that I would go with were ranchers, and we would take what felt like 50 kids. And everybody had a bike, because that's how you got around. So my friend's dad would load up his horse trailer full of bikes. I'm sure we were a sight to see, but wow, the memories that place provided. Fast forward to 2020, that, the year that remains in all of our memories and will forever. Once Disney closed the parks down because of the pandemic, our family decided we were going to opt out of keeping our passes. There were too many rules about face masks and then being told when we needed to make reservations to use our annual passes just seemed, seemed too restrictive for us. And I guess the rebellious side of me was, um, didn't like being told when I could go to the parks. That was the first step in our divorce from Disney. Disney, through the years, was always wholesome entertainment for the entire family. Generally speaking, the Disney image reflected and promoted godly standards and morality that I embrace because of my faith in and surrender to Jesus Christ. I felt safe exposing my child to Disney's content without fear of evil programming. Then something happened. We became aware that Disney content was changing by including and promoting more and more immorality. Disney no longer withstood the moral decline of the culture, but became a purveyor of that decline. I simply don't want Disney, which I once trusted, to teach my child or any children to be comfortable with or to participate in immorality. Then the Parental Rights and Education Bill was passed by the state legislature and signed by the governor. Disney decided to come out in opposition to the bill. They chose the wrong side of the moral argument. And that was the icing on the cake for our family. As a parent, I look to Disney to entertain my family and to provide the opportunity for us to make memories together, not to speak out into opposition, in opposition to a bill designed to reinforce the fundamental rights of parents to make decisions regarding the upbringing and control of their children. As a parent, I can no longer trust Disney. Education is my job. Entertainment should be Disney's. They have crossed a line. They have crossed a line when it comes to our children, and I will no longer help to fund their organization. Our first step was to cancel our annual passes. After the opposition, to HB 1557, we canceled our Disney Plus as well as anything Disney does. As a family, we have chosen to purpose the resources God has given us to other avenues. Disney has stepped into a ring with mama bears and that is not a fight they will win. <laughs> My hope is that Walt Disney's vision will be restored and the woke ideologies will be removed from Disney forever. Thank you. Right. You know, one of the things when, when, when COVID hit, you know, I was like, you know, these parks, I remember when Disney closed and then, you know, we started working like, you guys need to open back up and actually SeaWorld opened quickly and, and Universal Disney took a little longer. Uh, but, you know, they were doing a lot of COVID restrictions and, and, and different things like forcing the young kids to wear masks. And then as we got into 2021, you know, a lot of these Disney employees would come. They just see me at like Wawa or something and say, hey, I'm going to lose my job at Disney because of the vax, MNRA vax mandates uh, for COVID. And, you know, that was not something that we thought was acceptable in the state of Florida. And so we we're able to call a special session of the legislature and to provide legislation to say, you can't lose your job based on not taking the shot. And we did that not just for Disney, but for everybody. We did it for law enforcement and, and, um, and, and school children, no mandates for school children, all these other things. And so it was really important. But then what ended up what happening, so a lot of the Disney, we were able to save a lot of the jobs. But, you know, they would treat them differently if they didn't do the shot, a shot that doesn't prevent you from getting infected or spreading it anyways. And we knew that for sure by then. And yet they'd make them wear masks or do this or do that. 
And so one of the things we're going to be doing in the upcoming legislative session uh, is to protect people's right. To, so we have the man mandate bans, all that. We're going to make all that permanent in Florida. We're also going to go even more and protect your civil rights to be able to participate in society without having to wear a mask or having to do some of these things. These should be personal choices. Um, and, I, and I know also, you know, this board, they obviously can come in and make it clear that for all the patrons coming, you know, to, to Disney, that they have a right to participate without having restrictions or masks or anything like that. How do you put a mask on a three-year-old kid on rides and stuff? It's ridiculous that they did that. And I just like, as a, I mean, you know, we have 642, they wouldn't wear a mask for 10 seconds. Like, it just doesn't work. And so uh, I'm glad that we were able to stand up against some of the madness. I'm happy that the legislature and we're going to work on strong permanent protections for every Floridian job, citizen, whatnot. But I do think this board will be able, you know, to provide protections uh, for the patrons coming and for the employees as well as is necessary. Okay, uh, Nick, you want to come up here and... Thank you, Governor DeSantis. Thank you for everything you've done. Uh, you covered a lot about what I was going to talk about. So, so my name's Nick Catarano, everybody. I'm a 19-year cast member. Uh, my uncle opened up the Disney Parks in 71, and uh, I followed in his footsteps. He loved it. He uh, retired uh, only a few years ago uh, before passing. Um, and I have loved my job, as, as many of us, a lot of my cast members are here, right, sitting in front. And I uh, loved my job for years, just interacting with guests, uh, making magic, which is what Disney was all about. Um, but things have drastically changed, and my feelings have gotten altered. Um, in the beginning, with these, when the pandemic hit, we were all blindsided. Um, and it was pretty dystopian. We, we, a lot of us didn't understand. A lot of things didn't make sense. Um, and we felt all alone. Uh, but thank God we have a governor in the state of Florida that has made a, the biggest difference. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about that. When Reedy Creek Improvement District was formed in 67, Disney con convinced legislators to buy into its vision. With special carve-outs, Disney has soared by building a brand that focused on providing family-friendly fun and a wholesome, safe environment and content that parents, children, and people everywhere can enjoy and celebrate. Disney movies became instant classics with colorful characters and lessons about morals, integrity, and values, with villains as object lessons as what not to be. Seems like that's been inverted. Now everybody wants to be the villain all of a sudden. As a union leader during the lockdowns, I was proud of helping fellow cast through hard times of uncertainty, fighting to keep people's jobs through negotiating with Disney directly, and feeding, uh, we had a food bank that fed thousands of families weekly. Um, so we were heavily involved in, in trying to make this better for everybody. Fortunately for Floridians, the lockdowns didn't last long here in the state of Florida. And we all returned to work in waves under a cloud of fear. And as the governor was discussing, we had to wear face masks and shields. Um, it was unreasonable because we were walk working very long hours in fast-paced positions, and it was really hard to just breathe. I caught myself sometimes just stopping breathing, and I couldn't understand why my body was shutting down, but it was just the, the reaction to it getting so hot and overheated. I was stunned when I was informed that vaccine mandates were coming and we, we would be let go if we didn't take an EUA shot with no long-term data. I tried to show understanding of the fear that was all around us. I tried to be understanding of people's positions and understood Disney was in a complicated situation. Um, but I feel that that fear was created by denying early successful treatments and CDC protocols that made matters worse and fear sore. With the, friends, with the help of friends in hopes of reasoning with Disney and anyone who would listen, we created the website GoofyVaccine.com. I wrote an open letter there that you could read that has aged pretty well. Many cast members were absolutely terrified to speak up for themselves or even each other about the hesitancy. In the United States of America, you couldn't have an opinion at work. It was just total fear. Nobody could talk to each other. Uh, they were communicating in secrecy, and uh, I had enough of that. They were intimidated, harassed, bribed, coerced into taking shots. I know of serious vaccine injuries and deaths that resulted from that, from that coercion, but those of us willing to stand found each other and have stood together and organized, my friends here in the front. We locked arms with firefighters, medical professions, vet professionals, and concerned citizens. Support, su support came in from around the world. Unfortunately, little by little, the coercion worked and many did still cave. 
The situation was dire, not, not only just for us, but everybody in the state of Florida, to take an experimental vaccine or lose the ability to provide for yourself and your family. And at the brink, the governor stepped in to end the mandates and saved our jobs. Thank you, Governor. Many people ask me, how do I know the governor made a difference? Well, I was communicating with cast members all over the country. In states like California, Disney denied, denied religious and medical exemptions in mass, extending into the actors and into the studios. In states like Illinois and Ohio, I, I, I was in, I'm still in communication with cast members who work remotely, never saw anybody face to face, and yet they were fired for not taking the vaccine. It was unbelievable. I know people here in Florida that were, after the, after the legislation, Disney was still requiring a mandate. They were looking for loopholes, and, and I know people that got the vaccine and are vaccine injured and are still scared to talk about it. That fear still exists, and that's why we're here talking about it. The difference in those states are clearly our governor, and yet even after we lost our jobs, Disney turned up the pressure and discrimination on unvaccinated, on the unvaccinated and those with religious objections, making us feel like vectors of disease. Uh, and, and making us take breaks, segregated breaks, masking when the unvaccinated didn't have to, and making us stand out as others when we knew the vaccinated were getting and spreading COVID just the same or even worse in many cases. Many of my friends and colleagues lost their dream job as a result of standing up for their religious convictions. Stephen and Barbara are here. And, um, and we believe and know our governor understands how wrong all this is and we're ready to support legislation that ends this discrimination nightmare once and for all in the state of Florida for good. And we're just glad to hear your words on that, sir. Uh, if it wasn't bad enough, Disney has since doubled down and embraced all things woke, increasingly making things like sex, gender, race, and worse things the core mission of its storytelling. You know, we've gone from Cinderella's and, and Snow White's and, and Pocahontas and, and all these great stories with morals and, and great characters. And they have brought us stuff like uh, Little Demon, who was a spawn of the child of Satan as the lead character. Uh, we have recently seen the uh, cartoon Proud Family on Disney Plus. Um, and that, that really doesn't tell the whole untruth of, of what happened in our country. And they try to build a narrative that everything in this country is built on the back of slaves and reparation and what they're doing is they're taking vulnerable children and they're indoctrinating them into becoming activists and hating each other um, it's a profound evil and it's really a battle for the soul of our country i call it tools in the marxist toolbox and disney is a leading influencer of children around the world and these are the choices they're, they're making this is no accident disney plus shows so shows like bay max where a transgender man gives tampon recommendations on a kid's show Three years ago, I would have been, it would have been unimaginable, but Disney found a way to justify opposing the governor's parental rights and education bill for pre-K to third grade from being exposed to sexual themes, teachings, and conversation. Disney embraced the misleading, politically charged misrepresentation of this bill instead of drawing the line and standing for sanity and soundness in protecting children. I was going to go into a lot of examples, but I think all of us have seen these videos uh, that have been released of activist teachers around the country feeling it's their responsibility to talk to children about their sexual preferences and stuff. If I did that in my neighborhood, I'd be arrested. But teachers are somehow have this carve out, and the governor has had the courage and the good sense to, to, to put a stop to that, but Disney has caved to the activists and, and, and seek to promote it. Um, we've seen the videos of kids being dragged to, to drag shows and events all over the country all of a sudden, uh, where a lot of these videos reveal that children are present when pornographic uh, Things are happening. I mean, it, it, it's and and we we've, we've dealt we've digressed into this situation where instead of Disney, who has such a leadership role and taking a stand and leading and, and understanding the slippery slope we're in, they they've helped propagate this problem. They're they're by by fighting against such a simple bill as the the parental rights and education bill, they've signaled that it's okay to sexualize kids, and now they've opened them up all to all kind of victimization. That's, that's sure to come. So we thank you, Governor, for being so brave. Uh, we thank you for letting us be a part here today. And thank you, everybody. Right. Well, thanks so much. And I think that some of the stuff with, with COVID and Disney, I mean, it's not unique to Disney. 
I think we had elites in this country spin different narratives and corporate America largely bought those hook, line, and sinker. Um, you know, they, were, they said that lockdowns would stop the spread, that it was false. They said mat cloth masks would stop the spread, that was false. They said school closures were somehow no big deal, that kids wouldn't miss a beat, uh, and they were wrong about that. They said MNRA vaccines would mean you would not get COVID if you took the shot. They were wrong about that. They denied the existence of things like natural immunity for people that had recovered from COVID. They were wrong about that. And they lampooned and ridiculed anybody who said that this, uh, this COVID came from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And they were wrong about that because we know it did come from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So when you have narratives and a current thing that's always put out there, and then you have all these powerful corporations adopting that and then imposing that, you know, in some respects, they're exercising public power. Uh, they're exercising power over our society by colluding uh, to, to enforce that current thing. And I can't think of very many things these people were right on with respect to the COVID stuff uh, over the last few years. And I'm just happy to say that uh, when we were standing here all by our lonesome in Florida, we were willing to fight back and really we helped lead the way uh, back to sanity. So, um, <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna put my John Hancock on this piece of legislation. That'll, that'll make it official. And so just look at your watch and you'll know at what time the corporate kingdom finally came to an end. Governor Ron DeSantis, uh, the crew here at Station 4 uh, had a small token of our appreciation for what you've done for us, okay. and we just wanted to take a quick moment to present this to you. What do we got? We have a... Oh, man. <laughs> this... This ax has been a part of the Reedy Creek Fire Department Special Operations Team for a very, very long time. And that stand was custom made by Mr. Whitley here, uh, just for you, sir. All right, anybody back there? Got any questions? Yes, ma'am. Right, I mean, so uh, all through the Reedy Creek era, there would be major projects that would be done in Orange and Osceola counties that would basically feed in to Reedy Creek, but they wouldn't pay any of it for it, even though they're, one, they're probably the most uh, valuable piece of property. So there's specific provision in the bill given the state under the control board 
the ability to assess the taxes so that they're pulling their weight and so that they're paying their fair share with respect to infrastructure projects. Uh, also, just the board is going to ensure uh, that Disney's paying its fair share with respect to the value of its property, which obviously they have not been doing. So uh, it's going to be good for taxpayers, the average, you know, the working folks in Central Florida. I think you're going to get more bang for your buck on infrastructure now. And that's really how it should be. I mean, these are, you know, decades of subsidies and benefits that have really accumulated to kind of this one powerful company. And now we're basically just uh, on an even playing field and what's good for Di what's good for SeaWorld is good for Disney and that's just the way it's got to be. I, I cannot believe they let this guy. You have to hold people accountable. This idea, and I know the district attorney, state attorney in, in Orlando thinks that you don't prosecute people and that's the way that you somehow have, have uh, uh, a better community. That does not work. And you have these people when they've had multiple arrests, multiple times where they could be held accountable, and you keep cycling them out into the community, you are increasing the chances that something bad will happen. Now, this was obviously horrific beyond belief that that would happen, but there are criminals that are committing serious crimes, maybe not at that level, but other serious crimes that maybe don't get as much news, and that happens. And when I see police officers who've been, who've been gunned down, and you look at the guy that did it, and he's got a long rap sheet, and people have just been passing the buck. One of the things we're doing in our crime package is we are going to, and the Supreme Court has to bless it in Florida under our Constitution, but you need to have these judges hold these people accountable. They know, you can't release them without bail. I mean, you have to have, there's going to be detention, pretrial detention, potentially, uh, but just cycling them back out on the streets is a huge problem. But these prosecutors need to take this seriously, because I think most people know, you know, the, the average person, the majority of people in Florida would just never commit a crime because they just don't, they don't want to do that and it's, it's not in their nature. There's other people that can be deterred. Maybe they would do it, but they don't want to go to jail, so that's enough to keep them. But you have a small element of people that the way to protect the community is to get them off the street. And the only way you can do that is if you prosecute them when they're committing this criminal activity. So the question's about you know, what were we looking for with, with this board. Uh, you know, these are folks who have a variety of experience that I think all are pertinent. You got a lot of business experience because there's a lot of business issues. You're talking about this debt, making sure that that's retired properly, maybe even accelerating uh, retiring the debt. Uh, so, so that's important. There's taxes involved. There's a bunch of stuff. We also have people that have experience in local government. This is ultimately a state agency that's running this, but a lot of the principles are the same in terms of how you, how you manage that. And so, so we do have that. Uh, we also have people that very much um, want to see uh, Disney be what Walt envisioned, which is what we all want to do. I mean, we're, you know, honestly, in spite of all the stuff that's happened the last couple of years, you know, I've always been very proud of, of our parks. I've been proud of so many people that have been able to come to Florida over the years. I mean, it's almost like a, like a rite of passage for people to be able to come down here. And I think a lot of families have had really great experiences for many times, you know, but when you lose your way, you know, you gotta, you, you gotta have people that are gonna tell you the truth. And so we hope that they can get back on. But I think all these board members very much would like to see uh, the type of entertainment that, that all families can appreciate. But I do think the business acumen and the local government knowledge and the legal knowledge, we got people that are very smart in the law, uh, in this, there, there can be some, some different things. If they're eventually in the, going down the road where they're negotiating with the counties uh, to dissolve the state's role and just give it to the counties permanently, which, you know, we would like to do at some point. We're only going to do that if there's no, no problems or no burdens placed on the taxpayers. 
but, but they have the ability to do that. So I think they've got great experience and they're from, uh, you know, we do have some people from Central Florida, we've got people from other parts of Florida, so I think it's a really good mix. Yes? Excuse me? So we're, we're review, like I said, you know, we're reviewing the relationship with the college board. Uh, we really like when students can get college credit in high school. We've expanded things like dual enrollment. But I think what, what I've just noticed is that the Florida has subsidized this one company, College Board, when there are other companies that I think want to compete. And so I think what we're looking to do is, is have more of an open market to where schools can pick the best, uh, best way for college credit. But I don't think it should be necessarily having the state of Florida have a thumb on the scale for one particular company. So, so that's, that's ongoing. But I think people can rest assured that uh, you know, if you send your kid to high school in Florida, you know, you're going to have uh, uh, adequate opportunity to get, to get college credit. Because I like the fact that people can go to our state universities and they can graduate in two or three years, sometimes because they've been able to get college credit, sometimes with AP, sometimes with IB, sometimes with the Cambridge exams, sometimes with dual enrollment. There's a bunch of different ways that you do it. But I do think that that's good because it saves students money if they're able to graduate earlier and allows them to get on with, with, with their lives if, if that's what they want to do. You know, it's, it's fun. They used to say, well, you might as well do four and a half years, like if you're going to UF, because you get an extra football season in and do that. Uh, but I do think, like now, people, people if they can get, get going, I think that they want to get going. So, so we're going to make sure that that, that can happen. Well, so what we're doing, actually in my budget, I proposed uh, pretty significant increases for state attorneys. I think that you have people that, that come out of law school, a lot of them, almost everyone has debt when they come out. Uh, if you're making, I don't even know what the bottom is, but it's not a lot of money. And so if you can make it more attractive, I think you'd get more people that would want to do that. And, and maybe you get some folks who, um, who could really, really make an impact on that. Uh, we've also done uh, a variety of different things for, um, you know, we have juvenile justice in the state of Florida that is trying to identify people that may be losing their way and try to get them on the right track early. But when that fails, when they keep doing stuff, then if they're a danger to the community, you know, we really believe that, that you gotta drop the hammer because you're protecting the other folks in society from somebody that, that's just not willing to listen. But one of the things that we're, we propose this year in the budget is to create basically a school district with our Department of Juvenile Justice. So if somebody commits, you know, somebody gets in trouble, it's a juvenile, they go, you have an ability to shape that curriculum and to shape the school to try to get them going in a better direction. And we're, we're committed to doing that but not at the expense of just cycling people back out who really uh, have shown that they're not going to ever, ever get on the straight and narrow. Okay, thanks everybody for coming. God bless everybody. Yeah.